morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out uh, and uh, joining us to uh, talk about whales and cetaceans. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. I'm really honored because uh, I've been to I was to the two previous superpods, and I was in the audience. So um, it's kind of special to be up here talking. Uh, and I very much appreciate the invitation and, like I say, the honor. Um, as Kim suggested, I'm just going to kind of warm things up today. Mostly, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, or just kind of briefly go over some of the subjects we'll be uh, hearing from over the next couple of days. Uh, everything from, we'll be hearing from Dr. Ingrid Visser about the uh, fight to free Morgan uh, from captivity in Europe. We'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Lori Marino about the uh, plans to uh, create um, cetacean sanctuaries. And uh, we're gonna be hearing from a number of people about um, what I'm mostly gonna talk about today, which is uh, the plight of the southern resident killer whales. Uh, including uh, the plans to, and efforts to take down the uh, four Lower Snake River dams and uh, various other fights we have going on to try to restore our salmon runs. Um, but I thought, let's see. <sighs> I, I would ruminate first, I, I'd kind of like to think a little bit about, uh, you know, when I was here for the my first superpod, I was talking to with some of the uh, whale advocates who live on the island, and not all of them were terribly excited about superpod because they couldn't really see the relevance of um, the captivity issue to what they were doing in terms of fighting to save uh, wild killer whales, and and I just kind of smiled because I you know, what I I have have seen from the time I first saw blackfish was that it wasn't just a window into uh, the world of captivity for these killer whales, but it was also a world into the world of killer whales in general. And this is particularly true, of course, because of the ending where everyone uh, comes out here to San Juan Island and goes out on the Western Prince to see whales. And what we've seen since the film came out is that um, in addition to obviously raising a lot of awareness about uh, killer whales in captivity, it actually also made people aware of killer whales in the wild because we've been seeing here on the island literally thousands of people coming here to see killer whales in the wild because you know what they realize? They don't have to go to SeaWorld to see them. They don't have to see them in captivity in an enclosed tiny tank. You can actually come here and see them like this, uh, roaming free and doing what they do. Um, and you're not seeing a caricature like you see in SeaWorld, you're seeing the real animal. Um, so, um, it's actually had a really profound effect, I think, on opening up the window to the rest of the world for what we're doing here on San Juan Island, as well as I think the plight of, you know, the situation that we have uh, with killer whales around the world, um, where so many of their habitats are under threat and, uh, and you know, endangered. Uh, this isn't the, I mean, this is the only endangered population officially, but there are quite a few populations around the world that are at risk because of the loss of habitat. So, um, that said, uh, I thought I would talk about where we're at with, with captivity. Um, obviously, uh, blackfish had a huge effect in, turn, in turning down, uh, or in changing the business model, or I shouldn't say the business model, but the actual business of captivity because um, uh, SeaWorld stocks uh, have just been plummeting steadily, although in the last uh, few months they've actually been rising partly because of uh, this. This is a, a whale, an orca being captured by the Russians. Uh, and these uh, killer whales, this is out of the 
population that's just on the other side of the Pacific from us here, um, near Vladivostok and in the Kamchatka Sea. And um, they are taking quite a, a number of them and selling them apparently uh, to exhibits like the new Chinese um, cetacean captivity facility in Beijing. Um, so this is act what it's actually done is has had the effect of revivifying SeaWorld's business because um, SeaWorld is basically planning to start uh, or you know sort of revive their in involvement in uh, cetacean captivity and breeding, uh, but just not in the United States. They're going to do it overseas, and they're not going to use necessarily Icelandic or. Uh, Pacific Northwest killer whales are gonna use Russian killer whales. So uh, that's a bad thing, obviously. Um, we also had a situation here at home uh, where we have an administration that has been uh, gutting uh, recovery programs for salmon. It has been cup gutting uh, whale protection efforts and recently they uh, uh, have nominated uh, the man who who actually uh, ruled against OSHA in, or actually filed a, a ruling. He, he was uh, part of a three panel or a three judge uh, panel on the DC Court of Appeals at the time that the Sea uh, World ruling hit the courts. And he was the only out of that three judge panel. He filed a dissent uh, saying that Sea World actually had. Uh, every reason to uh, just let its trainers get eaten. So, uh, and we probably expect he will become a Supreme Court Justice. So, um, but those are, those are political issues. Uh, we actually have, in addition to the sort of policy issues going on, we have very much real world problem here with the killer whales in the Northwest. And the big problem is food, lack of food or lack of salmon. Um, there are a lot of other issues that are related to this. They include, you know, uh, vessel noise, they include pollution, they include, um, you know, heavy boat traffic uh, changing their behavior. But none of them are as profound as the lack of food because all of those other problems tend to be minor if they have lots of food. But if they don't have any food, then all those other problems become uh, almost as profound as, as uh, their starvation. Um, now, you know, two years ago, we, um, we had a kind of legendary event out at, uh, during Superpod week, out at the lighthouse, out at Limekiln Lighthouse. And while we were there, um, we were, <laughs> with everybody gathered, uh, sure enough, J and K pods came right by us. Um, and uh, we had uh, a gathering of young people there, and they were lucky enough to celebrate with a, a rainbow behind them. Uh, I managed to miss the double breach that happened right <laughs> under this rainbow, <laughs> but it did happen, I saw it. <laughs> Um, and yeah, it was, uh, we had an audience uh, with young, full of young people and uh, the hope for our future. Uh, one of them is going to be speaking here with us today, right, London? <laughs> <laughs> the other two, I think, are still getting here. Uh, <laughs> the one on the left is my daughter. Um, but. Uh, and there was, there's Mike going right by us. We were standing right on the rocks there. It happened. Um, but that year was also, it turned out to be a really terrible year for killer whales, for the southern residents. We lost seven members of the um, population that year, which was a huge loss. Um, and uh, it took us down to 78 whales. Uh, one of them, of course, was Granny, uh, J2. Um, and by the way, we'll be hearing uh, from, hearing this week from uh, Mark Blair and 
Young, who has put together a terrific documentary about Granny, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing that. Uh, but Granny was very special to many of us, and uh, had a special place in our hearts. Um, and this le that leaves this orca. Yeah, sorry. That leaves, this is L25, AKA Ocean Sun. She's about 85 years old and she, now she is the oldest member of the Southern Residents surviving. Uh, she also happens to be, uh, we believe that she is the mother of Tokite, AKA Lolita. Um, one of the really difficult losses we had in 2016 for me personally um, was uh, this whale, the one on the right. Uh, this is J28 Polaris. Um, I happened to have a, a really uh, fortunate experience a few years before, back in 2010, uh, when she had just given birth to her calf here. This is J46 Star. Uh, and I, got it, I was out very early morning in my kayak and uh, uh, just was hanging out in, along the west side and here came these orcas and, and uh, J28 and J46 were nuzzling and playing together for about an hour near my boat and I got quite a few photos and it was a really lovely experience and um, uh, it was, you know, it was fascinating to watch um, I, I wrote about it in my book of Orcas and Men because um, it kind of reminded me of you know my own parental relationship with my then uh, very young daughter, um, and uh, it, so it was a very touching scene. Um, but in September of that year, well, actually earlier that year, uh, researchers at the Center for Whale Research in 2016 had seen J28 um, with her then new calf, J54, uh, and uh, she was not looking healthy. She had the peanut head, uh, sunken head behind her uh, to the rear of her skull, which is always a bad sign. It usually indicates malnutrition. And uh, it just got worse as the summer went on. Obviously, she was expending a lot of energy uh, feeding her calf, but she was also clearly having difficulty getting enough nutrition for herself. Um, I spent uh, one afternoon, I didn't bring my camera along, of course, because I just, that's my luck. Uh, but I spent one afternoon there at the lighthouse just watching J28 and J54 um, hanging out there at the, in that bay uh, just to the right of the lighthouse. Uh, with J46, and you could see J46, who was now, you know, what, five, six, seven years old, uh, trying to help her mother find fish. Uh, and it was really kind of heartbreaking to watch. A um, month later, um, J28 did indeed disappear. Um, Mark Mallison happened to catch this photo of J54, probably in his final hours, uh, being held afloat by J46, his sister, and one of his cousins. Um, he probably didn't live long after this photo was taken. Uh, you can see all the rake marks on his face. Other photos from that same session had him, showed him covered with rakes because they were using their teeth to try to keep him afloat. So um, that was a big moment for us. I think it was when we finally decided we'd had enough. Uh, we organized a press conference in Seattle and we tried to get the public's attention that this is really happening. And I think it actually is starting to catch into the public consciousness now that we could lose this population. Um, you know, it, we've, been, we've been taking it for granted for so many years. Uh, we've sent scientists to study the problem and they mostly wring their hands and say, well, we need to get more salmon. Well, how are we gonna get more salmon? Well, it's a political problem. And, um, but ultimately the, the issue does come down to fish. There uh, are several main sources for the fish. One of them is in the winter time, they feed up off the fish that are uh, provided by the Columbia River. And those runs have been in serious decline for some time. 
um, mainly because of these, uh, the four dams on the lower Snake River. These dams only provide about 3% of the entire Northwest Energy Grid there. Entire, and we actually produce a, a, an annual 17% surplus. So it's totally expendable. Um, they only exist for really for the purpose of barging and, and barging is no longer a viable uh, business model for most farmers to ship their grain with. So uh, they're really pretty useless and uh, they're killing off a thousand miles worth of salmon habitat behind them, uh, particularly up to the world famous Salmon River, River of No Return in Idaho. Um, but we are making some progress. Um, uh, and incidentally, there really hasn't been any progress made on the four lower Snake River dams. In fact, uh, the representative from Spokane, a woman named Kathy McMorris Rogers, has actually uh, got a bill passed in the House, I don't think it's going to pass the Senate, unfortunately, uh, that would essentially make those four dams permanent. So make it impossible for you to take them down without even, with even a court ruling. So, but we are having some progress. Um, this is one of the dams on the Klamath River in Oregon, and they're about to come down. Uh, Klamath is a relatively small river and doesn't provide that many salmon uh, to, into the system, but it's, um, it, it's a step. <laughs> um, we also need to do something here in Puget Sound. And one of the biggest problems we have is culverts uh, in farming areas. And fortunately, we have had some progress there also. Uh, we're, uh, the tribes took the state of Washington to court over these illegal culverts that they have in some much of the farming system. Uh, they won that case, and they won it in, at the state Supreme Court level recently. Uh, interestingly enough, the same, you know, we have had some progress also in terms of Governor Jay Inslee has stepped forward and, and tried to uh, provide some kind of leadership on this issue. Uh, but simultaneously, his same administration was going, going to court uh, to try to uh, overturn that culvert ruling. Uh, what they really need to do is just in the next, next session of the legislature, budget the money to replace these things so that we can start getting salmon back in Puget Sound. Uh, because that's normally what these, back historically, that was what the killer whales came here to uh, eat, along with the Fraser River runs out of Canada. But now that's the only thing they eat is those Fraser River runs. And those are in trouble too. Uh, we had here, we've had here, you see that top graph. Uh, the key there is that little red line at the bottom left of the upper graph. That tells you what our salmon runs have been like <laughs> this year. Um, they actually have stepped up a little in the last couple of weeks. I wasn't able to get an updated chart. Uh, from the Albion fishery, but, uh, so that's a lot of the reason why we're actually are seeing some killer whales around. Uh, but um, this, uh, uh, basically the, the Chinook runs out of the Fraser River have just flatlined the last two years. We're not sure why. Uh, it could be uh, overfishing in the seas. It could be uh, ocean warming. That's certainly a hint of that because a lot of the runs that are uh, not returning are actually um, from higher elevation uh, uh, sources, so that suggests maybe they have temperature sensitivity. Um, but um, what we do know is that, uh, uh, that they are not coming back or haven't been coming back, and uh, Canadian officials are somewhat mystified by it. Um, one of the suggestions is that um, th this is uh, where the Fraser comes out. This is a map of where it comes out. And um, as you can see, it goes right through Vancouver. And what they're starting to realize is that uh, the uh, runoff, the urban runoff, including some sewage 
uh, seepage, uh, could be what's actually killing these runs on their way out to the sea. Um, this is, by the way, courtesy of my friend uh, Monica Whelan, who uh, has been posting a lot of this information, including that chart right there. Uh, and there are issues, including um, there's been talk about um, making, banning all vessels on the west side of the island. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the, the number of whale watch boats out there, but it would also include kayakers, um, which I'm totally opposed to. I guess <laughs> I love to kayak, but no, actually, I, I, but I, as you can see, I've observed kayakers being bad too, and so they are part of the problem. Um, uh, we all need to do our part. And um, that's kind of the, the point, is that we all need to join arms, um, stop thinking about uh, our little turf wars, and rather start farming more cooperative efforts to uh, bring these animals back, uh, bring the population back, and particularly to bring the fish back so that they have something to eat. Um, now, I, I, I'll, I'll just want to close real quickly. I had a conversation with one of our other speakers a couple days ago. And uh, as many of you may know, my day job, I um, uh, write for the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, and the last two years have been pretty hellish <laughs> for me. Because <laughs> um, I've been covering a lot of, a lot of all right, uh, basically riots and events and all kinds of ugliness and hate crimes. And um, that's actually somewhat related to uh, this change in administrations that I referenced earlier. And I, I was chatting with this person and she said, well, uh, I sometimes feel guilty working on something like whales when I've seen the country descend into under the threat of fascism. And um, I just said, you know, it's the same fight that what this fight about is about is the same fight that we undertake at the SPLC. And it's the fight to determine what kind of human beings we're going to be and what kind of world we want to make. Um, and that is, so I don't think we have to feel bad about fighting for killer whales. Uh, in a world where uh, we do face a, some real serious problems uh, politically, uh, because in the end, this is about empathy and our humanity, and I think uh, the whales help us rediscover that humanity. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that these kinds of events will uh, tie us together in ways that uh, that other things can't. So thank you very much.